And welcome to Video Game Hangover. I'm Randy Dickinson, and I'm in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Hey, I'm DJ Ross. I'm in Mountain View, California. Each week on Video Game Hangover, we talk about the games that have been keeping us up at night. This week, we're playing Anodyne 2 and later Alligator. Plus, we're digging deeper into Valheim and wrapping up The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. Oh, wow. I finished a Legend of Zelda game. Finishing games. Yeah, that doesn't happen that often. I mean, I was... Talking about finishing a Zelda game. <laughs> I mean, Zelda games in general don't happen that often. <laughs> yes, yeah. I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't finish games very often, unfortunately. And uh, I, I seem like I finished Legend of Zelda games even less. And yes, there are not that many of them. But uh, uh, yeah, I finished a game, and it was a Zelda game. So it was a good week. Nice. There are probably way more Zelda games than I imagine there are. They're like a bunch of Game Boy games that I never played. There are those weird, like, Philips CDI ones. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I only play Top Shelf Legend of Zelda games. <laughs> right, yeah. I was, you know, I always had it kind of in the back of my head, like, I never played those. Is it at all worth my time to, just, like, <laughs> to just experience those? Uh, and I, I watched somebody streaming them a few weeks ago, and they looked so bad. So mm. I think I can, I, I'll be fine. Just, just never playing those for myself. Yeah, yeah. There's a, um, there's an animated segment at the beginning of this new version of Link's Awakening, and there's you sort of revisit that at the end of the game as well. And uh, uh, you know, it's like Saturday morning cartoon kind of animation and it just it's real jarring to go from from that to the bright shiny kind of plastic sheen of again this version of Link's Awakening um I, I, again I, I don't know why Nintendo would choose to to make that leap why could you not sort of <laughs> do do that cut scene in the beginning and at the end sort of in the engine of the main game but it's just a real weird choice because it doesn't look great honestly well, if I remember in the Game Boy version, there was like this. It's not a whole cutscene, obviously, but there was like this super anime version, like a anime looking Link that it shows at the start, right? Because he's on his raft in the middle of a storm, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and it just shows him like just there for a couple seconds. It's about all you can do on a Game Boy. <laughs> but uh, it sounds like maybe this, like that's where the inspiration came from. Probably, yeah, I'm sure. It is weird then that it just, yeah, like you said, jumps immediately to like, oh, there's Link and he's a little like weeble person with no <laughs> nose or mouth or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at that, not that Link talks ever, but yeah. Right. Why does he even need a mouth to begin with? Right. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I can I, drink just, potions, obviously. Right, yeah. Um, no, no. When does he do that? Well, he drinks potions all the time. What are you talking about? What, or he drinks milk anyway. <laughs> he drinks potions. He doesn't drink potions in Link's Awakening? I don't believe so. Hmm. Okay. I just spent 30 hours with it. I don't think I drank any potions. Oh, man, you're missing out. There's <laughs> a secret potion room I didn't find, apparently. <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, I finished uh, Link's Awakening. It's, uh, man, it was a rough start to this game, and I'm glad I found the walkthrough that I mentioned uh, in my <laughs> previous episode. It's um, like a rough start over, like, the course of a year or so. Yeah, it was uh, just 2019 was my previous game save, so it's been, uh, I think, it probably 16 months, 17 months <laughs> since I last <laughs> attempted to play this game. And, um, yeah, I... I don't know. It's not. It is not an intuitive Legend of Zelda experience by any means. There were a number of times where I was really just felt like I was wandering in circles around some of these dungeons. And this game is a lot of dungeons. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, thank God for the good people of the internet to help me get through some of these things. Otherwise, I would still be walking in circles in in any number of these Legend of Zelda dun <laughs> dungeons. Um, so yeah, I cheated a little bit. I you know. 
whatever. That's fine. That's fine. I finished a Legend I of Zelda game. Absolutely. I don't know how much I consider that to be cheating. It's not like, no. you know, plug in your game genie or whatever. Right. <laughs> Flip the switch to auto win. Yeah. Right. right. Um, no, it's just, Sometimes uh, you need a walkthrough. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I need to sort of be efficient in the way that I sort of consume these video games. Uh, I... Yeah, I, I, it was nice to sort of wander around Hyrule for 250 hours uh, in Breath no, of the not Wild. Really. But... Oh, okay. Oh, okay, wrong game. I was just like, <laughs> yeah. what? Yeah, no, 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 not Link's Awakening in uh, Breath of the Wild. But I, I just, I was not willing to dump that much time into Link's Awakening. Um, and I wanted to finish this thing. It was in general very fun. I had a good time with it. I like the little sort of amusing cast of characters. It has this weird thing where it's the only Zelda game that I can think of where um, one, there's no Zelda um, and two, there's no character Zelda uh, and two, mm -hmm. there's tons of other like Mario stuff in it. There was um, a lot of Mario stuff in this. Yeah. One of the uh, first like buddies that you get in the game that you get to sort of lead around for a little while and he helps you fight bad guys is a chain chomp. Um, and in addition, there's Goombas <laughs> And um, what are some of the other things that are in there? The weird little things that are in the desert? The little um, pokey? Is that called pokey? Oh, little cactus guys? Little cactus guys, yeah, that are the balls stacked yeah. on top of each other. Uh, um, yeah, it, whatever. There's other Mario things in here. There is a character who is not named Mario, but it's Mario. Right, uh, right. And yeah. It's funny because then they they had another kind of Mario illusion in Ocarina of Time, but it was like oh. it was not the same character. They just they were like, let's put Mario in here again. <laughs> I guess it's just a Nintendo thing at that point. Yeah, and I but I I kept waiting for there to be some payoff. I kept waiting for there to be some sort of explanation as to why, you know, the, the characters from the Mushroom Kingdom were sort of leaking into. Link's Awakening and uh, never got there. I, really, I, I don't know. Uh, I kind of expected there to be some sort of story justification for all of the uh, Mario stuff to leak into this other than, you know, they're all Nintendo games, but um, it never came. Yeah. I don't really know what I expected back in the day. I think I was just kind of like amused. Um, plus there are little kind of side-scrolling sections in this or like platforming sections. Right. Uh, and so at that point, I was like, oh, this is different. Oh, there's a Goomba, uh, of course, because I, you need an enemy to stomp if you're doing 2D platforming, I guess. So right. why not? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And they, I mean, the fun they function just as they do in Mario games, where more or less they're there for you to bop on their heads and <laughs> collect a little coin um, or a rupee. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, uh, I, a good time with this. I. I I I don't know. I'm a, I guess a little reluctant to sort of just casually recommend it to people um, because it is not, and I've said this before, not a user-friendly experience. It really does not hold your hand in any way, and it really feels like it's sort of built around kind of an older uh, perspective on how to assemble a video game. Hmm. Um, and I uh, just was not willing to wander in circles <laughs> for 400 hours trying to find my way out of the dungeon so uh, i'm you know i made my peace with looking up some of the solutions on the internet and trying to figure out how to get the hell out of there <laughs> uh counterpoint if that sounds like something you would enjoy then i wholeheartedly recommend this game without even having played it because uh i think sometimes it's fun to get a little lost and try and suss out stuff for yourself yeah but like you said, you need to be, you know, expedient on how you uh, approach games these days. Right, right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I admire that about Breath of the Wild. I, I love sort of just wandering around and trying to figure out, you know, <laughs> what interesting thing or, or unusual character is going to be over the next hill. Um, I, just, I don't know. I just did not find I had the patience for that kind of gaming experience right now when, when consuming mm. Link's Awakening. Mm. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's... It kind of, you know, you have to be in the right mindset for it. I, right. I can see myself definitely, like, moving in and out of there as well. Sometimes I want to just, like, jump on stuff and have somebody give me a big sign that points to the next stage to go to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
there's a, there is a uh, like a weird little hint system built into this. There's occasionally you'll come across a house that looks like a telephone, uh, yeah. like an old school phone, and you can go in and you pick up the phone and and uh, one of the characters, Ulrira, will give you a little a little riddle uh, to point you in the direction of where you should go next. But even those were super vague. <laughs> I'm, where I'm like, just tell me where to go, old man. <laughs> and uh, nope, he would rather just sort of be cryptic and mysterious, and, and none of it really helped. Um, that must have been tough, though, because I feel like in games, when they try and uh, just deliver vague hints to you, they often go a little bit too far. Sure. Because sometimes you're not even necessarily like seeking out a hint, but somebody will just like, I don't know they'll just pop it up on the screen sometimes you're like oh that was too much i'm still trying to figure some of this out for myself <laughs> so yeah I don't know. yeah no, i agree it's it's a balancing act very much so and particularly since this is obviously sort of a modern remake of an older game i think there is a a, a juggling act that has to happen between uh you know that older kind of gaming aesthetic and and you know the uh, obtuse challenge of an old legend of zelda game um with sort of remaking it for kind of a modern mindset or my mindset at the very least mm -hmm. man if you thought the hints in this were vague you should go back and play that original legend of zelda <laughs> you'll just be like <laughs> what is what are they talking about <laughs> you know i was thinking um i i oh, geez i was probably uh small child the last time i <laughs> attempted to play that first legend of zelda and uh i was thinking geez, wouldn't it be cool if nintendo for the 30 wait, is this the 30, 35th anniversary of legend of zelda this year if they right. released one of those cool little game and watch devices that had the original zelda on it oh yeah like um, the mario one like they did the mario one yeah i would buy that and that would give me kind of an excuse and a motivation to to dip into that game that would be cool yeah I mean, you could just load it up on the, the Nintendo Online thing. Isn't you could just there? load it up on any number of Nintendo devices I have in my house within arm's reach of me right yeah. now, I'm sure. <laughs> but, that also. Yeah, yeah. But why not one more little toy I have to buy? Sure. I mean, I won't argue with another way to play uh, Legend of Zelda. Yeah. Keep that walkthrough handy, though, for that one. Because uh, <laughs> imagine you're going to run into some trouble spots. Oh, yeah, no doubt. So oh, yeah. So without spoiling anything, uh, what did you think about the end of this game? Um, I wanted a little more. You wanted more? Oh, yeah. Forget it. Okay, get out of here. <laughs> I um, I I was a little unsatisfied by it. I thought it was a bit of a fizzle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All you right. disagree. You you think this is uh, a, a strong ending for a Legend of Zelda game? Oh, the great ending. I mean, I don't yeah. need everything to just be like, here's oh, you finish the game, here's 90 minutes of like cutscenes and like falling action as we just tie up every single loose end in this game. But I thought it was uh it was very memorable. Yeah. It's it's very much not like any of the other Legend of Zelda games that I've completed. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, uh, and, and uh, so in that sense, sort of it defied expectations. Um, and yeah, there was definitely sort of a current throughout this game that felt a little more um, experimental, mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess. Mm -hmm. A little more, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know, there, there is a similarity, a pattern to how a lot of these Zelda games sort of play out. Um, and uh, Link's Awakening does not stick to that <laughs> in any way um, from a story perspective. So, it, you know, if, if I don't know, it, playing this, if you're expecting sort of beat the bad guy at the end and everybody lives happily ever after, uh, it's interesting that Link's Awakening doesn't quite go that way. Um, so, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I give it points for sort of defying expectation in that regard. But no, I, I don't know. I, I, I think I had unanswered questions. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. We can discuss offline. <laughs> <laughs> right. I thought um, it was all kind of self-explanatory, but who knows? Maybe I'm dumb. I don't think... No, I don't think that's true. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Maybe they changed it for the remake. Who knows? I know no, that's a that popular thing to do these days. that would be an interesting conversation as well. Yeah. Oh, man. Let's not talk about that. Yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I was just thinking, one, one of my favorite um, game endings of all time is the 
ending to Zelda 3, uh, Link to the Past. And it, that game is not especially story heavy either, especially compared to the current Zeldas. But I feel like maybe it had more of what you were going for or what you were looking for in this one. Hmm. Because what I love about it is, you know, not to give any, anything away or anything, Link saves the world from Ganon. And then after, you know, you reunite with the princess and, and whoever, it kind of does like this flyover of all the characters you've met along the way. Mm-hmm. And it just kind of tells you what they're up to. Oh. <laughs> and it does it in like, it's a very like succinct Super Nintendo kind of way that it, it does all this. It just gives you like a couple lines about such and such, what they're getting up to. But I thought it was yeah. so great. Um, it was just such a, a great um, just thing to watch for a few minutes after you Excellent. finally completed this quest. I've played and I believe finished that game, but I don't remember that. So that's uh, that's interesting. Oh, man. Yeah. Plus, it's got that ending song. So good. <laughs> I don't know. It, I mean, at the time, especially, it was just so far beyond uh, what I expected from a video game ending. Oh, sure. Which is typically like, oh, you save the princess, Mario. Here are the credits. <laughs> uh, so that was very cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting what we used to sort of accept as story in a video game. Yeah. Yeah. I would turn that around and say I think it's interesting about what like the expectations we had for like how much story a video game needed. I've seen a lot of stuff going around online this week because uh, the new Monster Hunter is out uh, mm-hmm. this weekend, uh, and apparently there's like there's some controversy about um, some content that has either been like withheld or delayed for a um, a post launch update. Mm-hmm. Uh, including what it sounds like, um, like some monsters, obviously, but um, like some of the story, like this is how I first heard about it. People saying like they've taken some of the story out of Monster Hunter Rise and save they're saving it for a post-launch thing. And I'm just like, dude, if you're playing Monster Hunter for the story at this point, I don't even <laughs> know what to tell you. <laughs> I mean, and and who can say like the who knows what's really going on behind this thing? I feel like it's like may have been impacted by uh you know just the pandemic and uh, affected development schedules and all that sure um but i think it's just like i think it's a silly thing to get worked up over i don't know yeah i mean you know it's not like that stuff was extra excised from the game and they're going to charge you for it further down the line on the road it's right right it's more monster hunter that's coming eventually i don't know i don't know Right. I just think it's it's such a silly contrast compared to, you know, remembering uh, playing Monster Hunter back on the PSP, where it's literally just like, talk to this guy, he'll give you the quest, you go out and kill the thing. <laughs> Eventually, there yeah. are just no more quests for you to do. And this one, they're just like, oh, no, what happens at the end? We won't know what happened <laughs> until this update comes out. Yeah. It's not narrative driven. It's not like you're playing the new Uncharted and they cut the end off of it to right i can't think download of download in a month the, uh, a similarly absurd uh, equivalent with, with the uncharted series i don't know <laughs> i mean that yeah. game I mean, clearly that game is much more about the story experience so that would be very egregious if you like like uh you got to the end and they said oh to be continued in three months right. see you then um that'd be sad that'd be like um halo 2 or 3 or whenever that happened but uh, again, totally different series. I'd... Yeah, Monster Hunter. I don't know. Well, I mean, we we still accept that in Mario games. I, I mean, that's, you know, it's not there is not much more to the plot of Super Mario Odyssey than than rescue everybody at the end. Um, yeah, yeah, and it, you know, it's not like it's a game full of intrigue and double crosses, and you know, enemies become friends and friends become enemies. It's it. You know, it's a Mario game, pretty much through and through. Yeah. Um, Peach is not in peril for this one, but you're still trying to save someone, something. Um, so yeah, you know, I don't need that in every place, but you know, I like it in the right places. And Zelda is one of those places. I just think it's weird how it seems like there's such a, a an increasing drive for Zelda or, or Link or whoever. Um, I guess Zelda, the series, to become more story-oriented. More substantial because, in that way, yeah. Right, because every time a new one comes out, they're just like, why doesn't Link talk in this one? Why doesn't anybody talk? And 
I just think to myself, like, why why do you want them to talk? Why do they need to? What are they going to be saying? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where I stand on that. I Yeah, I, I'm, I like a little... I, I don't know. I think the sort of Zelda... The Zelda games uh, are, have enough of a sort of an interesting cast of characters. And, you know, there's room in there for someone to be not who they seem to be or someone to be, you know, uh, uh, duplicitous in some way, a little palace intrigue. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I they've, they've done yeah. that at points. Yeah. Are you saying they've, I mean, that's as far as they need to go or they're doing enough? I don't know. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's, uh, I think that's satisfying. It doesn't have to be. Actually, I don't know what sort of what I would hold up as sort of the gold standard of storytelling in video games, but uh, I, don't know, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this. I guess yeah, Breath of the Wild. It certainly felt like there were enough um, mysteries and, and mysteries, not story, obviously, but there were enough sort of unanswered questions and and things I was wondering about and things that I sort of wanted that sort of propelled me through the game to sort of get sort of answers to or solutions to Mm -hmm. um and uh and yeah i think breath of the wild is better for that i think it could be just sort of an aimless wander if you didn't have enough of a a thing to sort of compel you to the next beat yeah i always think of this uh quote by uh shigeru miyamoto i forget if he was talking about zelda specifically he may even have been talking about breath of the wild but he was saying that he doesn't like to, I'm, I'm like 90% sure this was Miyamoto, but but he doesn't like to have like a full, like proper story in a game because he considers like the gameplay experience itself to be the story, mm-hmm. which I feel like Breath of the Wild is just the perfect realization of that because, you know, you look back on it and you go, well, well was there kind of a story? I guess there kind of was. It wasn't amazing or anything, but like all the conversation around that game was just, oh my god, I went to this place and did this crazy thing, and then this happened, <laughs> and I didn't know that could happen, and right. it's like all that stuff, and that is, I feel like that's so much more memorable. Like people generally don't talk about the bespoke uh, storylines in games in the same way that they talk about Breath of the Wild. Right. Yeah, I think so. The conversation about Breath of the Wild, at least initially. Um, uh, was about mechanics. Was about sort of constantly being surprised by you know how the world kind of interacted with itself yeah um yeah hmm Hmm. so i I mean i appreciate link's awakening sort of on that level in that you get in there and there are all these things that are not typical things you do in a zelda game or like at certain points you just don't know what you're supposed to do (laughs) yeah yeah and it is uh um uh, it is not like as you said it's not sort of vanquish ganon and save the princess um so it's satisfying in that uh, it doesn't do the thing that you expect a zelda game to do at the end yeah um yeah i'd like to see them but do again a little we'll more have to that. finish this conversation offline <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so right. we don't okay yeah don't spoil this 20 year old game for people. <laughs> anything away. i mean i think it's yeah. you know people having trouble with final fantasy 7 because suddenly nobody could talk about what happens in that game when the remake came out, so I kind of a similar case with this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm glad you ended up enjoying it for the most part. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm sad that it's over. I would happily continue to go back and wander around and occasionally check a walkthrough for what I'm supposed to do next. Uh, yeah, that didn't sort of diminish my uh, uh, the fun derived from the experience. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Did you find all the seashells or whatever? I forget what you're collecting one. in this. <laughs> oh no, that's the yeah, worst. Yeah, there's. Yeah, it's making me nuts. I have to figure out which one it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's uh, uh, secret seashells. Those are in uh, the link to the past and uh, link between world games uh, as well, if I remember correctly. Um, and those are tied to some upgrades, so you get sort of a better sword and uh, stuff like that when you turn in enough of them. And uh, I'm missing one. There's, <laughs> I believe, 50 hidden in the game. Uh, and I found all but one of them. That's my favorite thing. When just like, <laughs> there are all these hidden items. I'm going to do it. I'm going to find all of them. And then you're just like missing one forever. <laughs> There's, um, uh, uh, I, I looked up what do I get if I find the last one? Um, and <laughs> there's something in this version of Link's Awakening called a, a chamber stone. And you give it to, um, uh, Dompe, the, the, the undertaker the, the gravekeeper mm-hmm. 
and he then lets you unlock a couple of new panels for the the sort of the Mario Maker thing that's kind of hidden in this. I forgot um, about that thing. Yeah, where you can kind of assemble your own uh, uh, collection of uh, dungeon rooms um, and kind of challenge yourself and through the use of Amiibo challenge your friends uh, <laughs> to solving your, your dungeon puzzles. Um, and uh, I kind of fizzled on that a little bit. It, it's uh, You get a few rewards from Dompe for continuing to run his little experiments and build new dungeons, but... Uh, um, I don't know. I would rather just do the ones that come in the game. And there's enough of them, as I said, uh, to keep it satisfying. So I think I did the first two or three and he gave me a heart container for it. And then that unlocked like five more, uh, you know, challenges from Dompe to, to challenge yourself. Mm. And I was like, no, I'm not doing that. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there. Yeah. yeah. So the, the final reward for collecting all the seashells is you just get to unlock a, another batch of puzzle rooms for the... Um, Zelda maker that's built into this and I don't care. Well, it's a little underwhelming. I it is, know, yeah. I forget what the reward was in the Game Boy version because that was totally not in there at all. Hmm. Right, yeah. Hmm. I would assume what, uh, probably another heart container. Yeah, well, <laughs> It's always the the big compelling thing in uh, the Zelda games is give me as many hearts as you can. Right. Oh, it's just too bad there's no way to look up that information. We'll just never know what it was. Yeah, yeah, lost. Lost to time. <laughs> uh, well, cool. I'm glad you uh, you stuck it out. Yeah, I'm glad I went back to it. Absolutely. It's, uh, it was a little bit of a black hole, unfortunately, in my Legend of Zelda history. So I'm, I'm glad I uh, felt compelled and inspired to go pick it up again. Nice. Uh, so what are you playing? I, uh, man, I played like 20 hours of Valheim this week. Oh, wow. I'm not expecting to do that. Holy cow. So I, I talked a little bit about it last week. At that point, I had played a mere five hours. But, uh, yeah, for some reason, it has just been, uh, uh, just been very compelling to jump back in there and work on the, <laughs> my Viking outpost and <laughs> chop down some trees and stuff. Excellent. Um, it's very surprising. It's like, first of all, it's it helps that it's like a good social game. So a lot of the time, um, like my friends and I will find an evening, we can all jump on the server and just figure out what we want to do over the next few hours. But it's satisfying in a way that um, like Minecraft or like similar survival games are satisfying. And I've talked about this before, but it's just <laughs> continues to be true. And it's kind of <laughs> hilarious because... I feel like the progression in this is very similar to other games that I've played because you're just like gathering resources and using them to build a base and better equipment. And you go out and fight monsters who you were like not strong enough to face off against previously. And mm -hmm. then it just loops. You just go back and with better materials and build better stuff and explore out farther in the world. Sort of like you, you would do with Minecraft or like Dragon Quest Builders. But in this it it just everything takes so much longer because you have to physically walk everywhere and like come back to the base and everything just kind of a weird <laughs> difference between those like in minecraft it's so easy you just punch a tree or, or mine some ore and you go back and uh everything's so close together it's very convenient but it helps that in valheim it's very enjoyable to just be out exploring and it it, it feels a bit like breath of the wild in that sense where you know i don't really know what is out there in Valheim's world. And I've been kind of keeping it that way intentionally and resisting the urge to just go on like the Valheim wiki and figure out, oh, there's this thing out here if you explore in this direction, or this is a monster you can fight, or this is a goal that you should be working towards. But I'm just taking the time to, you know, discover things for myself. And I think that's sort of how my whole group is approaching this. <laughs> that like occasionally somebody will ask a question on the discord and be like so can you do like such and such in this game and the answer is not like oh well i looked it up on google and here's the answer everybody will just be like i don't know <laughs> i guess we'll find out later when we get there which is kind of refreshing hmm. and there's nothing sort of pushing you or channeling you in that direction it it it, it i don't know it, it is it aimless in the sense that you could just I mean, I have a friend who tweeted that they were mostly just playing Valheim so they could uh, uh, run a pig farm. Mm -hmm. um, is it 
so uh, um, choose your own adventure, I guess, that you you could sort of go down the rabbit hole of something that isn't really sort of intended to be kind of the main game path. Oh, sure. I mean, I've done sessions where all I will do is just like work on stuff around the base and not even explore at all. And you could totally just, depending on what you find interesting about it, you could just spend a lot of time farming or mining ore or something, but... Like eventually everything is kind of in service to being able to go out and explore farther from your base and just figure out what is out there in the world. Right. Cool. Well, that's exciting. That's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's always interesting when some sort of secondary mechanic in a video game is so much fun that you don't want to do the main thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. if all you wanted to do was have a pig farm, then I guess you could totally do that. You're kind of just arbitrarily deciding to, like, to stop progressing in the game at that point so you can have an amazing pig farm right but i don't know that, that's fine that's, that's valid yeah you you do you yeah exactly yeah I'm not gonna judge people <laughs> one of the most surprising things uh that is, i've kind of realized about playing this though is that um, it reminds me a lot of playing death stranding because like one of the things that you need to do in this is you need to mine a lot of ore to build equipment and make upgrades on your camp. And um, so one of the, the things about ore, um, eventually you can build um, these teleportation portals, which, sure, <laughs> the Vikings had teleportation portals, I guess. <laughs> but what we've done is we'll like go out there and we'll build a remote outpost and um, just stick a portal next to it because um, you know it's much faster to get back to the main base that way and makes it easier to explore and reveal the map. But the catch with this ore is you cannot take any um can't take any of it through one of the teleportation portals. Oh. And also it's very heavy. You can't carry a whole lot of it at once. So it is kind of like a whole process trying to figure out how to get um just massive quantities of ore back to your main forge area at the base. Mm -hmm. And so what we ended up doing, or this is just how I'm handling it, is we will have an outpost. That is like way out there, wherever like the rich veins of ore happen to be. And we'll just mine up the whole area and dump everything into like a, a storage chest in that area. Uh, and then what you can do is then you can build a uh, like a transport cart, because a transport cart is very good at carrying back just huge amounts of ore. But the cart doesn't work well on all the rocky terrain that's in Valheim. So what you have to do before that is just build paths and like roads out to the main like or the, the outpost where you're keeping all the ore. You need an interstate, DJ. You got to pave some shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like okay, so we got all this ore that's way out there. We need to just have somebody courier it back to base. How are we going to do that? And what ended up happening is so you can like build. There's like pathing tools. You can put a little dirt path down. You can use other tools to kind of level out the terrain so that it's easier to drag a cart over it. Oh, I was kidding, but apparently that's you're building highways. Oh, no. Yeah, no, that's exactly what we're doing. And there have been, <laughs> been certain points where you did like ore will be on a little island that's slightly off the coast. Um, so I figured out how to just build a little bridge over the river to get there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, man, this is exactly what I was doing in Death Stranding. And there were long stretches in that game where I would just not be doing quests because I would just be figuring out how to, like, restore the freeways. Or, you know, I built that huge network of zip lines over the mountains so I could transport things easier. And so I imagine that is not what most people envision when they start up this Viking survival game. It's like, oh, yeah, right. we're actually... We're not going to be fighting anything today. We're just going to be con conducting a lot of just Viking infrastructure upgrades around this <laughs> island. Hey, it's infrastructure week, DJ. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Viking infrastructure week. But at the same time, I'll like look back over the bridge that I just made, which is just me combining all the weird like furniture pieces together. Because there's not just you can't just click a button and say, hey, build a bridge drop a bridge yet yeah it's like how do we combine these pieces of flooring and like wooden stump posts to get something that we can drag a cart over interesting but i'll, I'll like look back on it after it's done and be like oh man we just <laughs> physically built a bridge where there wasn't one before and that's <laughs> gonna make all our lives easier now and it's it's so good <laughs> oh that's funny 
So that's the whole like path of human evolution, DJ. You've kind of completely thrown it off. You've you've brought all this technology to (laughs) to the Viking era, and uh, we're gonna be you know flying around in space cars in twenty twenty one. I mean, we're we're saying like, I wonder how far this goes. Like, did can we get gunpowder eventually? I don't know. (laughs) Can we just build a car? All these Vikings. The birth of a civilization. Yeah, interesting. I don't imagine. Yeah. I can't imagine it gets there, but like, what if it does? That would be amazing. Yeah. Probably not going to happen, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, it's probably a pretty big leap from building a bridge to building a car. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I'm just so satisfied with the bridge. It just looks like like a legit bridge where previously we we're like a bunch of sad Vikings just dragging ourselves through the water. I'm like, oh, this is, <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> There's got to be a better way. Right. Oh, it's so good. Excellent. Anyway, now I just find myself thinking, you know, I'm not doing anything for the next half hour or whatever. Maybe I just log in and chop down some trees. So the next time everybody else logs in, there'll be some wood in the chest so they can, like, (laughs) turn into axes or something. (laughs) It's good. Awesome. Oh. Anyway, who knows? Wander out and kill any Viking gods or anything like that? Or you. Uh, We killed another boss, which was fun. Okay, excellent. We just got to kind of the the swamp biome, which again we just don't really know what's out there. Like we've seen some snowy mountains, so and we figure oh, we probably got to go there at some point. But the uh, the the swamp so far is so dangerous. We just go there and there's tons of skeletons pop out and just swarm you. It's terrible. So uh, that sounds like more of a group activity. <laughs> don't go alone. Right. It was so good. I mean, there was no way this was intentional. But the first time we went in there. We were just walking around, and I guess some skeletons spawned behind a tree where I couldn't see them, and they just happened to jump out right as I was going by. But it looked like I was like it looked like the skeletons were just waiting there to ambush me. Like the, there's no way they were actually designed to do that, but it was just kind of a <laughs> hysterical coincidence. <laughs> but yeah, I so I love just the the how much unknown stuff there is in this game. Uh, it it really kind of goes back to the the Breath of the Wild sense of yeah. Just, Absolutely. Like, what is beyond this next corner? Or are there going to be resources for us to mine? Or are we going to discover some completely new kind of resource? Uh, like, we just discovered, uh, we just found beehives, and now we can, like, process, uh, like, the honeycomb or whatever and make mead with it, which unlocks a whole new kind of, uh, like, crafting tree. So, Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. Who knows what else is hidden in this game? Neat. Well, was the, the question I asked you last week when you had just started playing was, do you, do you get why this is kind of all over the internet right now? Why people are sort of findless, so sort of compelling, where it's kind of come out of nowhere? And, geez, I feel like every other, you know, every 10th tweet about video games is about Valheim right now. Yeah. Um, well, so I don't it know. it sounds like you're kind of getting that. It sounds like you're sort of like, oh, here it is. Here's why everybody's sort of digging this right now and sort of into the, into the mystery of it. Yeah, well, the, the funny thing is, I don't even know if this is why it's resonating with other people as well. I mean, I this is something that I really like about it. Right. right. But, like, I really love just building roads and Death Stranding also. Uh, <laughs> so, who knows? There's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you can uh, can do in this game. It is surprising to me that you have not played, uh, or at least sort of reported on playing a lot of those, like, farming simulators or truck driving simulator kind of video games. Yeah. I don't know if they're like, I mean, they're all called simulators. I don't know if they're all necessarily simulating things in the same way. I don't know if, like, the, the idea of just building a farm... Are you talking about like the like Euro farming simulator where you're like driving that like harvester thing or like Star yes, Valley? Yeah, that's what I had in mind because it, well, it seems like as you sort of talked about uh, um, this video game and some other games, uh, like it's uh, uh, that there is a part of you that is uh, drawn to these sort of otherwise kind of mundane parts of video games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I guess it's just different. <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> I don't know if that's vague enough. Sure. I mean, you're not running around with a, a shotgun and killing zombies, so it feels like it's a new gaming experience. Right. Well, I mean, it's not necessarily that you are doing farming in those games. I think the fact that it is just the way it's simulated in Valheim is very interesting because you're, you like, it's not like, you, I admit, I don't know how those games work. I mean, I have some idea. <laughs> you, you till some land. Um, and then you you equip your hoe and like 
plant whatever crops you want. And this is like based on my half an hour that I played Harvest Moon like 10 years ago. <laughs> uh, but in Valheim, it's, it's, it's interesting because it just feels so much more organic. Because like I was saying, you have to like physically walk out into the forest and like swing your axe and chop down trees. And then you build, you go back to the base and you process the wood and build stuff out of it. And you have to physically construct a house that makes sense than a build that does, or a bridge that doesn't collapse uh, because there are no support beams under it. Whereas, like in those games, I imagine if you, like, you know, in Animal Crossing, if you want to build a bridge, you just say, hey, here's 80,000 bells or whatever to put a bridge right here, and that's it. Right. And you wake up in the morning and there's a bridge. Yeah. And that's not very interesting. But in this, it's just like, oh man, I made that. And it's kind of the, the same thing in Animal, not Animal Crossing, in Minecraft, where you have, there's no like, there's no simple way to just build a structure. You have to kind of like visualize it and put in the foundation and actually make sure that it kind of makes sense as a house. Like, can you walk around in it? Can you go up the stairs? Oh, you actually need to make physical considerations for where the stairwell goes and just weird things like that. Mm hmm. So, I don't know, maybe if there's a farming game where you have to, like, I don't even know. <laughs> I don't know what it would take to get me to play one of those farming simulator games. <laughs> Why would you when you can just play Valheim? True, or, true, yeah. yeah. Or, I barely even or... touched the farming in this, but just, like, I was on it the other night, and one of my friends who usually does the farming wasn't there, so I was like, okay, I'll try and figure this out, plant some carrots, and just the few minutes I was doing that, I thought, okay, well, this could be... This is cool, but, you know, I could envision, like, just having an entire outpost that it's only farms, and, you know, well, that's the farming base or whatever. <laughs> it just feels like the, you know, you're just, it's so open-ended. There's so many different ways you can approach just managing your base. Right. Yeah, I'm sorry, I have flashbacks to you in uh, Final Fantasy fourteen, just knitting gloves for months. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's fine. That's also sort of like... It's satisfying in a way where, like, oh, I made this equipment I'm wearing, but it's not like you have to physically design the equipment or anything. Oh, gotcha. Okay, I follow. Yeah. You can't, like, accidentally knit a bunch of gloves that only have four fingers. <laughs> right. It's like, oh, you accidentally just made mittens or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> See, you invented mittens. Good job. Yeah. At some point it does, you do just end up having to build, like, kind of prescribed items, like a... Uh, <laughs> You just craft specific pieces of furniture in this, so you can't. You, it's not a struggle in Valheim. To, to in Valheim, yes, to yeah. to build a chair that is structurally sound, because uh, you just click build chair at the crafting bench or whatever it is. <laughs> but I really enjoy the fact um, that, like, I was trying to build a new house the other day, and I thought, well, what if I had a different style roof than the last house we built? So I just spent some time trying to like concept a weird looking new viking house that was, that oh, was cool <laughs> i just imagine sort of a you know a wobbly janky chair and your friend's like i'm not sitting in that <laughs> right that looks dangerous <laughs> exactly someone's gonna get hurt yeah cool sounds interesting i i i, I it sounds uh um interesting from a from a theatrical standpoint to me it's not something that i don't i think i would find compelling if i was in it i you like never know. Sort of this, you never know yeah you never know until you try right um uh i sort of appreciate the simplicity of of that process in games like animal crossing where you you pay enough bells and suddenly there's a bridge the next morning i don't know that i want to build a bridge from scratch i don't know if i want to i've played enough of that uh what's that uh um bridge construction simulator or whatever that game is where you have to <laughs> yeah you have to build a bridge, bridge across a gap or whatever yeah yeah um and uh, uh and then you know slowly uh, trucks and cars start driving across it and it starts to sway and the timbers below start to buckle and snap and fall off and and yeah that's just too stressful for me i don't <laughs> want to know that i'm going to build a bridge in a video game and it's going to work I may have been making it out to sound more difficult than it actually was, but uh, it was just sort of the challenge of, can you even build a bridge in this? Because it just doesn't tell you to do that at any point. Right. And we kind right. of figured out that, oh, yeah, sure, you can. Well, there's a, yeah, there is something sort of satisfying in a video game of, of doing a thing that isn't sort of intended to be there, right? I mean, that's, um, I don't know, kind of the fun of games... Uh, well, a lot of fun in games like GTA and, and Saints Row and stuff like that, but kind of the the making of your own objectives, the making of your own 
you know, I don't know, secondary, unusual challenges that weren't necessarily part of the developer's vision for that thing. Yeah. Uh, the video game as playground, right? That's that's always a good time because you feel like you're doing something unique. You feel like you're doing, you know, I'm, I'm doing something in this game that wasn't intended to be here. Yeah. I think it just it, the fact that it's so open-ended and it gives you so many different ways to approach things is, is very interesting. In a weird way, it's like maybe the, the closest thing that you have played uh, to this would be like Red Faction Guerrilla in some way. Because mm-hmm. you can approach that as just like a third person competitive shooter or whatever. But that game, like everything in it is destructible. So after, at a certain point, you just realize, well, I don't have to go up to the top floor of this building to assassinate the, you know, the mission objective. I can just <laughs> destroy the bottom floor of the building and the whole thing will collapse. Right. Um, and then you just figure out like, oh man, so there are all these different ways I can approach these problems in the game. And it's similar to Valheim in that uh, like, oh, there's no way to get across this river. There's nobody telling me what to do about this. Let's just figure out how to do it. Or, right. you know, how do we build an outpost? What do we need for an outpost to be effective? I imagine it would also be different if you're just watching other people playing and seeing how other people approach problems because then you kind of have an idea of like maybe the commonly accepted approach to things or maybe the way that developers intended for people to play this so again i'm just very satisfied that we're uh we're not sort of like seeking out uh, information or explore or explanations about what to do in this game it's all kind of right. just self-taught i suppose i follow yeah cool i'm kind of curious like i want to watch streams of people playing this to figure out what is working for other people but at the same time like i kind of don't want to spoil myself and i don't right, you want take away to just... that sense of discovery yeah yeah exactly or if i just see somebody's awesome outpost then i'll just start thinking well maybe if i built everything in the same way that they did it would be better but you know then i would just be doing the same stuff that other people have done <laughs> right exactly anyway continues to be very good i'm playing it much more than i expected i thought i was just going to be like oh you know, like, don't starve, bounce off that pretty quickly. Or I feel like I've internalized how Minecraft is supposed to work at this point, but uh, Valheim continues to surprise. Cool. Excellent. So shifting gears a little bit, I have this other game that I played this week that uh, I want to talk a little bit about called Later Alligator. Hmm. This is a, a fun little kind of single session game where you can uh, see the whole thing in about uh, two, three hours. Uh, it's a, it is a pretty unique um, kind of point and click adventure mystery game where you play a private eye um, who uh, sort of connects with a character who thinks he's going to be assassinated who thinks he's going to get rubbed out yeah. um, and then sort of employs you through the course of a day. You get a single day to solve these things because he thinks he's going to get rubbed out at a big event that night. Uh, so you have until the event starts more or less to sort of figure out what's really going on um, uh, to wander around uh, New York city uh, and ask a people a bunch of questions and try to investigate uh, and solve, uh, solve the mystery of this and try to figure out what's going on with your client. Um, the 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 i don't know the unusual the funny hook here is that um it's not just new york city it's alligator new york city and okay that you're an alligator private investigator and everybody that you're talking to is an alligator as well okay yep it's fine <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, uh, it's very funny. It's, it's a lot of really just super smart, super funny, very witty dialogue. It is packed with jokes. It's packed with a lot of dad jokes. So it has a lot of sort of grown worthy kind of humor to it, which totally works on me. I'm susceptible to that. Um, uh, but it, 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 there is some very bright uh, uh, and amusing writing and, and sort of joke delivery happening in this game. Um, I like dad jokes. Are just right in the zone where you want video game jokes to be. <laughs> they're just like they're not great, but you can like you. Everybody can see the humor in them, and they're just like, oh sure. man. But it, I feel like a lot of times when video games go out of their way to be funny, it doesn't always work that well. Right. I think so much of um uh, of humor it hinges a lot on kind of 
rhythm and timing and mm -hmm. it's hard to get that right in a video game i think um if the animation doesn't quite feel as fluid or the the voice acting doesn't feel as sort of uh, on point or you don't have voice acting you're just reading it and you don't have control over timing and delivery in that situation so mm -hmm. um i think it's hard to sort of be I mean, I think of, of shows like 30 Rock, where I feel like 30 Rock was just a joke delivery machine where like every scene in that show was so kind of intricately written and then delivered so brilliantly <laughs> that there was sort of a rhythm and a pace to the way that jokes were kind of pumped out of that television show. Mm -hmm. um, and you just don't have from a developer or, or a, a, um, a player's standpoint, you don't have that level of fidelity and control over what happens in a video game to be that jokey. Um, so, yeah, I think dad jokes work because they hinge less on timing and more on on sort of the, the goofy <laughs> reveal. Right. Um, right. Yeah. There's a chart that I'm envisioning, which shows like how funny your joke could be if it like pays off really well and it's set up correctly. And it's like really spiky with these high peaks and valleys and all that. And there's like the, there's like dad jokes, which is kind of a flat plateau through the middle of the chart. It's like not going to blow people away. People just kind of grudgingly accept the humor in it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I I won't say that that's the case about later alligator. I, I don't know that there was a scene where I sort of like, sure, I accept that as a joke. I see what you're doing. Well, I mean, um, I don't know if anybody's like, oh, yeah, hit me with your best dad jokes. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't think people necessarily complain about it. Right. Right. I think that's true. They're just like, oh, fine. Fine. Yeah. I can't believe you there said is something that. sort of warm and comforting about, about sort of the rhythm of a dad joke, right? About the payoff, the, oh, that's great yeah um yeah uh so yeah i think later alligator hits that um and <laughs> you do have um it's not sort of like a hardcore investigation thing this is not a sherlock holmes game you have uh, a, a, a a notepad that basically has three questions on it and you ask those three questions of everybody that you encounter um and uh um their answer to those three questions um, can be little funny my, uh, dialogues, little funny uh, asides, little sort of backstories about their interaction with sort of the character who thinks they're going to get assassinated. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it's just sort of always kind of amusing to see sort of where where just simply asking those same three questions over and over kind of leads you uh, through the course of this little investigation. Um, and then sort of the challenge uh, as it sort of comes into the game is inevitably the characters will be a little tight-lipped about sort of the big events and don't want to share anything. But maybe I could let slip a little bit of information if you solve this puzzle for me. <laughs> Okay. Or if you play, and we're, here's where it sort of turns into a, a Professor Layton game in a lot of ways. Um, uh, uh, if, or more of it, so if you sort of play this little mini game for me. So one of them is sort of like a little claw game where you have to sort of pull uh, things out of, you know what a claw machine is, pull things out of a claw sure, machine sure. for a little girl who has uh, some little nuggets of information you're hoping to uh, solicit from her. Um, and, and on and on and on. There's a, a ton of different uh, little mini games packed into this. I believe I've read that there are 30 different mini games that you can unearth. What? Um, and that means there are 30 characters that you can talk to who all have their own little challenge sort of associated with them oh they all have a the, unique mini game interesting correct yes yeah uh there's a pinball machine there's um uh there's a there's somebody who's having issues with their cell phone and you have to go through all the apps on their phone to try to look for things that are different or or broken uh and then you delete those apps to try to make their phone work better it doesn't sound compelling but when you're in the rhythm of it it feels super fun i can imagine um, that yeah um and uh and on and on and on so th some of the fun in this is just sort of trying to uh figure out kind of what is the game what is the challenge what what is this person going to sort of spring on me to sort of uh um challenge me to do so that i can get this little extra little nugget of information off of them <laughs> um uh yeah yeah and those are super satisfying i like those it does have uh like a Wario world kind of vibe to it where, you know, none of the controls are consistent between any of the games and, and you really only get a couple of seconds to sort of figure out how to respond and how to play it. Um, and, uh, and you kind of need to quickly be good at this little, this little instance of a game uh, within a game and, uh, uh, or you don't get the information you're trying to get. Hmm. So it's, uh, it's fun. Yeah. There is a, an, uh, a satisfying sense of discovery to all of these little games that are kind of packed into later on. Alligator. What happens if you mess up one of the games? You get to try again? 
you, there's a few of them I found where it will prompt you to try try again, but it cuts into your time. You like I said, you have a limited amount of time before the event that night. Oh, and this is happening like semi real time. Kind of, yeah, in video game time. But hmm. it'll it'll ask you if you fail. It'll say, "Would you like to replay?" But it'll cost you 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Good. And then maybe in that 15 minutes, you could uh, have interviewed two more characters and played two other games. So you have to decide sort of the push pull between: <laughs> is it better for me to interview more characters and see more of the game, or really specialize in interviewing a few characters to try to solve the puzzle that way, to try to solve the <laughs> the mystery that way? Oh um, man, I would make the worst private detective <laughs> just be like oh i just i know i can beat this claw game if i just play it like one more time and then the entire it's like three hours later my client has been assassinated it's like oh didn't do it um yeah and again sort of as a reminder everybody that you're interviewing everybody in the city everybody in the world is an alligator right that had not left my head i've just been thinking about that constantly okay excellent um <laughs> it's not alligator city it's alligator new york city they they refer to that quite often as well so um i thought okay, that oh was that just... i didn't understand from before yeah. although they were just like wait so it isn't new york city like, this could it's be alligator new york city. We, we don't know where alligator new york city is <laughs> on a map no but it is it is comparable to new york city except this is all alligators okay yep that's right next um, to alligator new jersey right <laughs> Which is not far from New Donk City, I'm sure. Yeah, well, no, that would be Alligator New Donk City. <laughs> Ding! I think you figured it out, DJ. So this is a lot of fun. I enjoy this game quite a bit. It's um, it is built. The structure of it is built in such a way that you can't realistically get to every corner of the city and interview everyone before the event happens that night. So you kind of go into the big main event at the end with limited amount of information with kind of only half the story. Um, but it is built in such a way that you can quickly and easily sort of replay it again without having to go through kind of all the crap that you went through, all the introduction and all the sort of setup. You can okay. kind of just quickly get back to investigating and talking to people and making different choices and, and going down different, you know, uh, uh, alleys in the course of your exploration of the city to talk to different people so that you can sort of complete the picture uh, and, uh, uh, and and more or less sort of solve the game one more time with uh, with a different ending, with a different outcome, with a oh. uh, a new set of facts and stuff like that. So it's, uh, it's kind of uniquely assembled in that. It really takes two playthroughs to be able to kind of see everybody. But the good news is it's pretty efficient. Uh, and again, you get sort of the sense of, of fun and discovery of interacting with all these kind of wacky eccentric characters who all have a little uh, kind of mini game and mini, mini challenge tied to uh, uh, interviewing them. Does the ending like change significantly depending on, I don't know, like your path through the game? Uh, not not significantly. It's not like, oh, suddenly there's a surprise ending. But you you... Your first ending is limited to the number of people that you sort of interacted with. So there is sort of a final occurrence, the final event uh, that I'm alluding to here mm -hmm. um, is only sort of attended by the people that you interviewed. So when you go into the second time, you've now interviewed more people. And so there's a bigger ending with more people in attendance and oh, uh, like et cetera, it, it, et it kind of they stack on each other like the, the playthroughs you do. Yes, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, OK. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, it is. It's it is interesting. It's uh, beautifully animated as well. It's done by uh, um, uh, um, a sort of indie animation team called Small Boo. They've and I had to Google this. I didn't know this off the top of my head, but they there is a little sort of series of cartoon shorts called Batman Piter Man. Have you heard of that? <laughs> no. <laughs> These came out kind of like 2012-ish. They were on the Nintendo video service on the 3DS when it first came out. There was a little icon you could click on and there, there were different not a sort Nintendo of Nintendo video service. What is there this? absolutely was. There were little indie animated shorts that Nintendo used to um put on their little video service. It was sort of Nintendo YouTube in a lot of ways, but it was cool little indie animation. Um, and one of the things that was on there was this thing called Batman Spider-Man. Uh, and it's kind of a goofy animated send-up of Batman and Spider-Man, oddly enough, sort of living together and being best friends. <laughs> but they're not so bright, and they're not so good at the superhero thing. Uh -huh. um, they're on YouTube now. You can watch it if you want. They're a little... 
I don't know, derpy. And <laughs> it's a little kind of hard to get through, but I sort of see the joke. Um, the folks who did the animation and the writing in that are responsible for the animation in later Alligator. So it has kind of a beautiful cartoon animation to it. Uh, it's just, I don't know, it, it, the whole game feels like just a fun sense of discovery and this fun little thing that I stumbled upon. Um, so yeah, later Alligator would highly recommend. Okay. <laughs> I think I get it. <laughs> I, I saw people talking about this when, like, before it came out or they were, like, finishing up the development on it and I just thought oh, this looks weird why is everybody in Alligator <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad it worked out I'm glad it uh, <laughs> put something together that's good yeah it's on um, PC it's been out on PC for a little while uh, but it just came to Switch uh, uh, in the past week or two so uh, it is you know available in a lot of places where you can get a video game hmm. okay well thanks for testing it out I will uh, maybe give it a shot yeah. Uh, so I played Anodyne 2. I think I will save discussing that for a future episode because I've been—I feel like I've just been playing it for like a month at this point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not super long. I've just been like playing a lot of stuff. I've been spending a lot of more time chopping trees than I expected to. Sure. All right. Well, I guess we should wrap this thing up then. Uh, if you need any more video game hangover in your brain, you should definitely follow us on Twitter at twitter.com/vghangover. Uh, keep in mind, you can always get show notes and links and tell us what you thought about the episode at vghangover.com. Uh, we would love for you to join us on our Discord as well. You can get a link to that at vghangover.com too. Yeah. Yeah. Subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, uh, anywhere else you can get a podcast and uh, tell your friends about the show. Yeah. We tell like them, that. you won't believe what these idiots are building in Valheim. That's not how you're supposed to play the game. <laughs> you're, you're doing it wrong dj yeah well i look forward to everybody <laughs> telling me how i should be playing it i don't know oh this it's my turn it's your turn yeah yep thank you again to felly kitty for our intro and outro music this week please head on over to fellykitty.bandcamp.com check out some more of our stuff i have to confess i've been looping uh the Pink Album, which is the album that our outro music is from uh, for the last week or so. It's great. Check Thanks. it out. Cool. All right. We'll be back next week with maybe Anodyne 2. Maybe Monster Hunter Rise, right, DJ? Yeah. Oh, God. There's a new Monster Hunter. I have to play that now. <laughs> maybe any number of a million video games that there are in the universe. Uh, so definitely come back next week. How exhausting. <laughs> you picked the wrong gig, man. I got all these trees to chop down. I can't do this runner. <laughs> Those trees will be there, man. Not if I had anything to say about it. Right, exactly. We're just going to clear cut Valheim. Just wipe yeah. it out. Well, well, thank you for listening to Video Game Hangover. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. Goodbye. Good night. See ya. In a while, crocodile.